What about tertiary education? Should it be free? Uh, yeah, the Greens policy around tertiary education is, get rid of fees. is um, to work towards a fee-free tertiary education system and um, a universal student allowance okay. um, and then to, so to how long would it write take? off students' loans if they stay in the country and contribute to the How long would it take to get to the Greens idea of free education? I don't know actually, yeah. I mean it's an important thing for students, they yeah, really it is. know. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think interest-free student loans have um, got have gone a long way towards mitigating some of the costs of tertiary education. Um, but ultimately, we, we see tertiary education as a public good, and yeah. and so that also relates to access to tertiary education. Actually, and some of the some of the things I'm really concerned about um, the direction of tertiary education policy at the moment is around restricting access to those who perhaps don't have high school qualifications and things like that. Okay, we've got a couple of questions in the audience. The man at the back. You, you've just talked about the goal of moving towards free tertiary education, uh, that's great. So why can't you say you're keen on moving towards no GST? Same kind of idea, it's ideals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I mean, I think I've covered those. That, that you avoided it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joe at the front. Um, it, it seems to me, Holly, that at the moment there's already far too many people walking out of universities with pretty much useless degrees. They've got BAs and they're going off to be secretaries. So oh, I support. Well, I, I, support. I, support. Oh, I support. Oh, 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 oh. The BA is a useless degree. I, I have one myself. Um, <laughs> so I support the idea of a free tertiary education, but do you not think that possibly you need to limit entry if we're going to provide it for free? Um, no, no, I don't. I think there's a lot in, in what you've said. So, um, and for, you know, for example, is the purpose of a tertiary education simply to get a vocational quali qualification to qualify you to do a particular job? And I would say no, because actually the jobs that are out there, um, the vast majority of them don't, there's no vocational qualification you can do for that job, um, but you can learn skills of analysis and, and research and you know, um, all, all manner of thinking skills that you can get from a, from a generalised tertiary education. So. Um, there is very much value in tertiary education as in a good in and of itself. Did you not and learn those on the job rather than spending $30,000 to fund a university to do it? Well, I, no, I, I mean, I think, the, I think the, that the skills and the analysis that you learn is part, of the, is part of the exercise of being at university. It's reading and thinking about ideas and, and that's, that's broader than what you learn in any, any particular job. Um, but around access, um, because that is the case, we have to, I think as a society, be very open to um, second chance education. So, um, you know, the example that Materia Tude, our co-leader, often gives is herself. So she, at age 22, um, had no school C, no sex form certificate, uh, had a baby, was on the DPB and thought, what am I going to do here? I need to make sure I can provide for my child. Um, so she went to law school. Now she got support from the state to do that. She got, a, you know, she had student loan and she got the training incentive allowance, which is an allowance that allows sole parents gives them extra support to go to university. Um, as a consequence, she became a, a lawyer, has provided for her family ever since, has never been back on the benefit, and has, I would argue, given a net contribution to society um, because of that access to tertiary education that was available to her. So, you know, it's difficult to quantify every individual circumstance, but those are the kinds of stories that we're talking about, and that's why access to tertiary education is so important. Okay, the other big question of the day, particularly today and yesterday, is the retirement age. Yeah. And, and Labour, in my view, has suddenly leapt to the right and adopted a policy that will keep people <laughs> working for longer before they can um, get superannuation. What do the Greens think? Uh, well, the Greens would like to have a national conversation about superannuation. So our policy at the moment is to keep the age at 65. Um, but we acknowledge, as Labor has done, and I commend them for doing this, that um, current policy settings around government super are not sustainable into the future. So, you know, my generation, our generation, will not be able to benefit from national super <laughs> if we don't make a change. But, but clearly that's a move away from addressing inequality and you're perhaps endorsing something that's going to make poor people receive less superannuation, Pacifica people, Māori people, so, because so they, look, they have shorter so lifespans. I'm, I'm not, so I'm not endorsing oh, what Labour has done. I think it's commendable. No, it's commendable that they've put the issue on the table because we need to have a conversation about making but, super more sustainable. Now, national super is a very interesting issue. There's few of them in New Zealand politics, but it's one in which there is a political consensus around that. You know, it was formed and has been maintained for some time. And I think what we would like to see is, is it's, a, it's useful to have a political consensus around the issue of superannuation. Um, so in a way, actually, what both Labour and National have done is quite, quite unhelpful in the sense of turning it into a political football at this election. Um, but La National, you know, John Key said he's never going to look at any changes, he's going to resign yeah. if you would consider the age, and, and Labour well, has put their head above the parapet. Stance, parapet. 
Well, it is, but it, it, it's putting his head in the sand. It's ignoring the huge, ballooning, unsustainable saying, cost of, of national superannuation. So what but we, isn't that just scaremongering by a lot of people that want to reduce entitlements for working people? I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's scaremongering to say that there's, a, that there's a huge and ballooning and unsustainable cost that we can't afford to meet under current policy settings. So but we're a very wealthy what, society. We have a lot of um, you know, wealth that surely we can afford that. I don't. I mean, I don't think we can it's afford just it at the that moment. Some people you know? have more of the money than others. Isn't <laughs> yeah, it? that's right. That's so right. Shouldn't so it be more about redistribution rather than taking away of people's so, entitlements? So, so if you were to have a national conversation about superannuation, um, in which you were moving towards a new political consensus, what I would like to see is all the issues, all the ways of of, tam of tinkering with national super on the table to look at equity as your primary um, goal. So, even so right as wing. you've mentioned, raising the age, for example, could disenfranchise people who are in ethnic groups who yeah. um, don't live for so long, could disenfranchise people who have worked their lives in professions that are very physical, which means yeah. they do... So shouldn't we get those options off the table rather than commending them? No, I'm, I'm the arguing we should, put, I, we should put options on the table that deal with equity as the prime... You know, we want to we want to look at how we can make national super more... Um, the sustainable in the future. It less, and it could yeah, I, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, what I'm saying is, I think it's unfortunate that the age is now the only issue that yeah. people are talking about. What I would like to see is um, is a national conversation and a political consensus developed around. Um, what options are on the table that are most equitable and it may be and i suggest it probably is that um the age alone is going to make it more unequitable so we need to have all those options on the table okay but conceivably the greens might change their policy after this conversation and have a higher age conceivably like conceivably but i think that that conversation needs to take place first okay it's just a bit of a shame going into election if we're uncertain about what the greens are going to our policy do. this election is to retain the age at 65 and we would and like to see a conversation take place about that we're not going to change that before do you promise the not to change that before the next the following election or our policy is um, formed by our members so i can't make any promises so about that so you might tell voters one thing and then change your policy after getting to power well, par parties change their policy in between elections. I oh, know, but you should keep to your promises in the election, keep to your manifestos, don't you think? Yeah, so we're going into the 2011 election saying we retain the age at 65, and that's what we'll do in the, in the term. And then, you know, our, our party, if this national conversation okay. takes place, if a conversation takes place between political parties, and then the, the democratic process that forms Green Party policy will take place in... You know, I can't predict what the outcome of that is going to be. Okay. Anyhow, I'm hitting you over the head with a few <laughs> um, hard questions, but I guess we want to know how you got into politics. Why are you standing for the Green Party? How did this all come about? Um, I can kind of trace my political uh, consciousness, I guess, to two um, two occurrences that happened to me in high school. So one, I was um, I don't know why, but I took fifth form economics, and um, <laughs> and um, I was kind of baffled by many of the orthodoxy, orthodox economic, you know, theories, very simple ones that were being taught in fifth form economics, and sort of debating with my teacher about those. And at one point, he said to me, "Oh, you are a trendy lefty, aren't you?" And I thought. <laughs> Oh, I'm a trendy lefty, yeah, <laughs> I want to be a trendy lefty. And actually I saw that teacher at a party recently and was able to sort of tell him, you know, um, that comment, he probably had no memory yes. of making it, um, had really stuck with me. And the other was in, uh, in fourth form social studies watching a video about the 1981 Springbok tour and seeing a young Rod Donald um, putting on his fluoro bike helmet and is, you know, getting into the front line of the, of the protest march and just feeling very... I'm um, inspired by that and I'm fascinated by the whole 1981 Springbok tour actually, but there's a whole other topic. Well, stick um, around after this, we'll talk about John Minto, we'll talk about yeah, it Yeah, exactly, more. exactly. So um, those two things kind of, you know, I, I think I've had a political consciousness um, about economic and social mm. issues from quite a, a young age. Um, and through my time at university, I wasn't involved in party politics at that time, but I was obviously writing for Critic and kind of... So were you um, a student radical? Uh, I think I was a, I think I was a radical student journalist. Okay. Yeah, um, and so exploring some of those political issues, both in my studies and um, and in my work at Critic, um, and subsequently kind of felt passionate enough about those issues, having explored them at university and and through my writing at Critic to. to take the leap to get involved okay, in party so politics and, and it was the Green Party that I felt really um, you know expressed and articulated the, the issues that I cared about. 
Okay. And so you studied politics and English, I understand. I did, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so when was that? When was when uh, 2001 politics? was my first year. Okay. Um, so 2005 was my, my final year in Dunedin, my year as And you were mainly into sort of IR politics or what did uh, you Mostly study? New Zealand politics, oh, okay. actually, and particularly um, with a focus on Indigenous politics, um, oh, Treaty so of Waitangi. So Janine Hayward. And, yeah, um, yeah. Um, okay. um, although I wrote my, my dissertation was a combined honours dissertation, English and politics. Um, so I did it in the English department. I wrote about three novels by Patricia Grace and how the concept of Māori development was articulated in those novels and um, changed over time in her writing. Okay, very good. Now, where did, where did you... Where did, <laughs> sorry, no. Let me explore that further. <laughs> but seriously, did you burn couches? No, nope, never burn a couch. Never uh, burn a couch. Where, where did you live? I mean, um, uh, what sort my of My first year I was in Carrington Hall, so I'd come down from, yeah. from Wellington and lived in the hall. Uh, and then I kind of moved around the place that I think, you know, first year flatting, I didn't want to get too far from the comforts of Carrington, yeah. so I flatted right behind it. <laughs> um, so if you like, if you're down on campus, you look up the hill up there, the highest flat you can see, the top floor of that I flat. Was... I lived in that flat. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's well. green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my flat. So, and then I moved around. So my final year here, I lived um, just above the Octagon and Stewart Street. And, uh, and what building? Oh, it's like a sort of a brick building with a couple of flats just on the right hand side, about 100 metres up. Okay, so uh, just to get a greater idea about you personally, your, <laughs> your character, and you know, to know whether we should be voting for you or not. Yep. Um, so where did you drink? <laughs> oh, all around the place. Um, I, I was involved, I was heavily involved in the debating society when I was yeah. here, so um, we used to end our Tuesday nights at the Cook. Um, as I, as I assume they still do, things don't change very much in the debating society. Um, and, uh, but you know, all around um, in flats mostly as well. And, okay. Yeah. How did you find, as a critic editor, getting down and dirty with the scarfiness, you know? Yeah, there was once or twice I kind of did my intrepid reporter thing and, you know, um, went along to Hyde Street or something <laughs> like that. Um, I was never really... I, I mean, I never lived in Castle Street. I never lived in the real student ghetto, and I felt a little bit um, removed from that, I guess. Um, so, but you know, it's, it's a big part of student life here. So, okay, question at the back.